Well, hello there, and welcome back. If you're new here, my name is Rusty, and this is me channel where I talk about me favorite movies, mostly horror, and me favorite music, mostly metal. And tonight, we are finishing up my first Man Plus Machine week with uh, my seventh entry, and that will be Automata. Okay, now, nice little Blu-ray DVD combo. Now, Automata was released in 2014, directed by Gabe Abenez, written by Gabe Abenez, Igor Loretta, Javier Sanchez Donate, and it stars Antonio Banderas, uh, Brigitte Hort Sorvinson, Dylan McDermott, and Robert Forster is also in it, and Melanie Griffith is also in it. And yeah, so we are going to give it a go, shall we? Now, Automata is set in the year 2044 after a strange violent um, increase and in solar storms have rendered the earth into a radioactive desert 99.7 percent of the world population has been exterminated has died now that's a little bit more than Stephen King's The Stand um, Stephen King's The Stand Captain Tripp's he killed 99.4% of the world population. In this movie, 99.7% of the population has been wiped out, reducing the total global population to just 21 million. So, what, like New York? <laughs> Maybe New York and LA put together? Or is that, would that be even more? Who knows? But, um, yeah, so there's only 21 million people left on the planet. Um, it's disabled, of course, as you can imagine. Most of the world's telecommunications and tech, you know, um, has been destroyed. There are some major cities left that these 21 million people live in. And, of course, we have a giant corporation. ROC, Rock is the giant corporation that created um, a line of robots called the Automata Pilgrim 7000s. Now, they created millions of these to help build and maintain the walls and the artificial cloud devices. It's like giant, um, like the Hindenburg, you know, but they create an artificial cloud over these cities that um, keeps out the solar radiation and it at least kind of allows those cities to be halfway habitable. And this is where the 21 million people live um, in various cities across the world. There's just a few major ones left. So, um, to protect humanity, because now there are millions of these automata robots, um, droids kind of things, they um, were instilled with two protocols. Protocol one is that you can cause no harm to life. And protocol two is that um, an automata cannot alter itself or alter other robots. Those are the two protocols that were put into place to protect humanity from them. So we opened then, after learning all of this, in sort of like the prelude, we, um, we see Sean, played by Dylan McDermott. He is on patrol where he stops at a sort of like underground garage kind of thing where he finds a robot. At first he doesn't know what the robot is doing. It's where like the homeless people live. 
Um, but then he gets suspicious. He turns back around. He lifts up where the robot is and comes to the conclusion that the robot is repairing itself, which would be a violation of the second protocol. Um, although he doesn't really have any proof, he kills the robot. He shoots it and kills it. We later, of course, well, I can get to that. But um, he kills it, and then we are introduced to our main character, Jacques. Now, Jacques is um, Antonio Banderas. He works for this corporation as an insurance claims adjuster, which means if somebody has, you know, one of those automators and they file a claim um, that the it damaged them or their property, you know, insurance claim. So we see him at a house where this couple is claiming that the robot killed the dog and they want to file a claim. He doesn't believe them really and he tests the robot by trying to stab himself and the robot doesn't let him. The robot is functioning perfectly normal so he basically turns around and says that's not going to work. You killed your own dog trying to, you know, to get an insurance claim. So glad to see that's alive and well and what little's left of the human population, right? <laughs> so he, you know, um, is doing this and we kind of get introduced to him. He has a pregnant wife at home. He doesn't really like living in this city. He remembers a time he was like a child when this occurred. He was like eight or nine. So he is haunted by memories of being on the beach before this event occurred. And you can tell he's really not happy in this city or this job. Um, so we kind of get used to that. They, he ends up being called about this robot that the cop Dylan McDermott's character that Sean had killed. Um, it has, it of course has been taken to a lab where they're looking at it, and um, he is called as an insurance adjuster, right, for this company to go and investigate at the morgue um, or the lab. You know what happened to this robot? Why did the cop destroy it? That's a lot of money, so the cops could get in trouble for destroying this machinery. So that's why he was there. So while they're there in the lab, they discover that the robot, not only someone's altered it, um, it contains pieces of other robots. And we learn that the people who do that, the people who alter robots, are called clocksmiths, which kind of makes sense. So... Um, he suspects that a clocksmith has altered this robot in some way. And um, he goes and reports that to his boss, Robert, the leader of the insurance department of this giant corporation, that um, he believes that a, clock, uh, a clocksmith had messed with this robot. Well, you know... He then informs him that he also would like a transfer. Like I told you, he doesn't want to be in this city anymore. He's not happy with his job or his life, and he wants to go to the coast and uh, try a different city and get away from this filth um, of this city. And um, while he's there telling Robert about this, Robert's like, "That's that just can't be true, but okay, you know, um, go ahead and investigate it. So he goes to the construction section where this robot was supposed to have been and um, starts investigating, um, especially the piece of robot that was in it was tracked to a robot that's supposedly still in operation at this section of the construction side of the wall. So he goes and finds out that its terminal is still there, and he actually sees it peek around the corner at him. 206 was its number, and 
he immediately feels real funny about the way this robot is behaving, the way it's looking at him. It walks away and tries to blend in with the crowd, which, you know, that's a human characteristic or a, or a sentient characteristic, like it knows it's in trouble or something. He ends up following it outside the wall. Now, there is a giant slum around these big cities where the even more poor people live. So he goes out into that slum. He almost gets shot because you can shoot anyone approaching the wall on sight. Um, looking for this robot that he just saw in there. Running from the gunfire, he does find it in like a cargo container. So he finds this robot and, you know, asks him, the robot, what are, what are you doing? You know, obey my commands, what are you doing? identify yourself, etc., etc., and the robot acts really strange, and he notices that the robot's carrying a little box, and he wants to know what's in the box. Well, the robot in this cargo container actually knocks over a jug of, I guess, oil or fuel, and sets itself on fire, basically committing suicide right in front of Jock. Well, what robot is going to commit suicide? You know what I mean? That's a little strange. What's it hiding? So he ends up taking that bot back to the lab where they are looking at it. They get it to um, come back to consciousness, hooking it up, you know, to, to the stuff. And it sits up and he asks it, what are you doing? Why did you set yourself on fire? To which the robot, you know, after identifying itself and everything, burns its own circuitry out, like commits suicide a second time, this time for good. So, he reports this again to his boss, who is like, we need to keep all this stuff quiet because the city, if we lose the city contract, we'll all be screwed and out of a job, you know. So he agrees, though, to let him continue investigating, just find out who altered this robot and keep it quiet and, you know, shut up and get, it, get the clocksmith and, you know, we can let it all go from there. So he starts investigating. He goes to the scene where the cop, Sean, had shot that robot and you could tell that the robot, you know, like a homeless person will have their little area. Well, you could tell this robot had been there for a while, and he found a hidden compartment in the wall. And in the wall, there was a bag. And in the bag was a nuclear battery. looked like a golf ball. A golf ball. Uh, only it was gold. And so he ends up taking that back to the lab. They tell him what it is. And... Um, he, d he interviews the cop, Sean, who you start to really realize is absolutely a psycho. And he enlists Sean in helping him find this uh, clocksmith by using the nuclear battery because that would be a very, a very expensive, very rare thing. So a clocksmith would definitely like to get a hold of one of those. So... Sean ends up taking him to, of course, a robot brothel because no matter what happens to the human race, especially if they're going to start messing with robots, you are going to have them find some way to turn it into a sex toy. That's just <laughs> humans. <laughs> humans. <laughs> so he goes and um, the madam introduces him to this female uh, bot that has been altered but not protocols just has been physically altered to be a sex bot and its name is Cleo so he starts questioning this robot and uh, Sean ends up shooting it and um, he jumps on Sean and is like you know you're crazy 
you're obviously got mental issues because he hates automatas so much and um, he kind of insinuates that I just helped you you just don't realize it because she's going to take it to get fixed and you can follow just hang out when she takes it to the clocksmith to get it fixed there you go so he's like well you're still a psycho <laughs> but okay I guess that could work so he ends up hanging out and sure enough the madam does take it to um, a clocksmith and it turns out to be um, Dupree Dr. Dupree now this is played by Melanie Griffith whom I believe at the time this was filmed Antonio Banderas and Melanie Griffith were married were still married but um, she's real cool in this movie she's got a short small part but um, she's real cool in it and he be begins to talk to her about Cleo about what he's investigating and she explains to him about evolution by using evolution she says you know you exist because a monkey came down from a tree seven billion years ago or something like that uh, seven million years ago and um, the reason it took us so long to evolve was because our minds physically and mentally are limited whereas if the second protocol was disabled the one that says that robots cannot alter themselves or alter other robots it would take them and their limitless intellect maybe weeks to evolve past us because they don't have the same limitations that we do so okay that makes sense and um, she's like I will look at your kernel the brain it's a little chip actually it looks like one of those um, little drives that you can have the little external hard drives that are about like that big that's what it looks like and it's basically their brain so he leaves that with her and he goes back home um, he is having issues with his wife because she's pregnant and he wants to leave and she's afraid of having to go start over somewhere else so you have the little personal aspect um, he then gets a message from her now of course the corporation they have found out the big boys they have found out that this robot indeed had the protocols removed and that's not supposed to be possible and um, about the time that they find out and it's like you have to f get everyone who knows about this and this has to we got to put an end to this right now so about the time that they find out about it and initiate their plan she also realizes it now the way she realized it Dr. Dupree was that even though the um, kernel had been messed up a little in the fire it wasn't dead it wasn't completely dead so she grafted a part of a regular one onto it and it functioned and she put it in Cleo and Cleo within hours had started exhibiting evolved behavior so she had messaged him and told him your vacuum has come down from the tree you know like the monkey come down from the tree so he went and saw her and she explained it to him and showed him Cleo and how Cleo had repaired herself and put her own leg back on which is against the protocol and was exhibiting human behavior or sentient behavior have to stop saying human but um, about that time the doorbell rings and um, she goes to answer the door and it's this little bitty kid and he's like you know are you Dupree and she's like that's Dr. Dupree to you at which point another little kid who's like a year older I mean we're talking about kids that are like eight years old another kid steps out from the side and blows her away like 
with a gun, like blows her away. I didn't see that coming, especially from a little child. So those little kids start then chasing him. They come in and start chasing him after they've killed her. They come in and start chasing him, and it's Cleo that helps him escape in a car, which is blowing his mind. There's a big car chase. They manage to get away, and they're out in, you know, and she drives way out into the desert where they have wrecked along with the other car that wrecked. She managed to save them by destroying the other car in a wreck. So he's hurt. He's out in the desert. He's unconscious. And when he wakes up, there's four. There's Cleo and there's three other robots, droids, automatas. And he's, he's injured and they're like pulling him on a car seat. And they're going deeper and deeper into the desert. And he keeps trying to get away several times. But he's very hurt. He's going to die. They're taking care of him, uh, creating a condenser, solar still. Um, finding uh, mealworms for him to eat. So they're keeping him alive and he doesn't understand where, where are we going? We're going deeper into the desert to which point um, they tell him that they're going somewhere safe that they can't go back to the city. Now of course you have the company who has found, found all this out and because he's missing from his mission, they have um, instructed Robert, his boss, and um, Sean, the, the cop, and another little posse of people to go find him. Now, Robert kept telling him that Jack is a good guy. Jacques is, Jacques is a good guy. He's not, he's not part of this. He's not doing anything. But because he's missing, they assume that he's part of this whole shenanigans and they're like, y you're going to go and find him. And unbeknownst to him, it's like, as a corporation would, we're going to make this disappear. So you're not just going to find him. There were secret orders to kill him and the bots and anyone who knows about this. So... The bots keep, you know, bringing him back to help as they go deeper into the um, thing while he keeps trying to escape. He does manage to get a hold of a flare gun, and he has them stop along the way, you know, and says that he has to go use the bathroom. Well, what he really does is scan the area with his binoculars, and he sees you know, the people who are after him. And he shoots off a flare, which was the worst mistake he had ever done. But he didn't know any better. Because he really isn't part of this. So they come, and he thinks he's rescued. But when Sean gets out of the, when that psycho cop gets out of the, you know, thing, the uh, automobile, He's like, thank God, take me back to the city. I'm so glad you found me. Well, the first thing that Sean does is, like, pistol whip him with a shotgun, you know, and knock him down, which shocks him. And he's yelling at him, you're a, you're a betrayer and stuff like this. And he's like, what the hell? And Sean ends up shooting two of the bots. And then he starts to shoot Cleo. But by this time, Jock has figured out they're going to kill me too and so he gets in a pretty good kill because he kills Sean by shooting him with the other flare that was a pretty ugly way to die the flare went into his chest and so he's screaming on the ground as it's burning and um, so yeah and the other guy he takes off that was with Sean he takes off goes back to the city leaving once again um Jock and these two bots, Cleo and the other bot. So they continue to go, and he has no choice but to follow him, but follow them because he doesn't know what to do now. 
and um, they tell him that they'll be at their destination tomorrow and that perhaps there would be an automobile there he could use to go back to the city. Well, the corporation, of course, and one of the other mistakes he had made was that he had managed to pull out a messaging device and send Robert a message saying that he was 25 south miles southwest of the city. So they kind of know his location. They, of course, send another posse, including Robert, out to, to get him. And um, him and the two bots manage to arrive at this little haven. Now, he thinks that there is a master clocksmith there, right? Who has started all this shit. And when he does get in there, and there is a bot there, he's like, where is, where is the guy who made you? Well, the bot informs him that there is no other humans there. And he's like, well you know, follow your protocols and answer my question. Well, the bot tells him he has no protocols. He's the clocksmith. He is the one who has done this. There was no human behind it. Now, this makes sense right here because we then go back to the city and we see the corporation t after they've gotten Robert they take him to the interrogation of the other guy that was with Sean, who is claiming that these robots were acting like they were alive. And the, the main CEO then informs um, Robert kind of the foundational truth. When they first created the Automatas, the very first prototype, it didn't have any protocols. And for eight days, they carried on a conversation with this bot but on the ninth day, they couldn't even understand it anymore because it had already evolved. This is why they initiated the protocols. Because they saw what these bots could become, these AIs could become, if left unchecked. Now, he says that the reason that no clocksmith could ever remove those protocols was because it was not created, the protocols were not coded by a human mind. They were coded by that original robot. So it's impossible. Now we understand when we see the boss bot who did this, given enough time and left alone to his own devices, the boss bot had spontaneously broken the code that was created by his ancestor. So that makes sense now because we know it wasn't a human clocksmith who had done this, it was another robot. So we have Cleo, the robot, the boss bot, and Jock at this little haven. They are also, the boss bot was work, is working on some kind of other robot that's really neat looking, it looks like it looks like a little, it's very, very interesting. It looks like a little caterpillar of some kind, but not. It's, 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 it's very interesting. So he is creating some kind of superbot or some kind of life form. And that's the last piece he needs is that nuclear battery, battery, which is why those original two robots were sort of in a, that at the beginning of the movie, that's what these robots were trying to do. Get a battery, get it out to that haven for this boss bot to create this new life form. So, Jock learns all this, and he does begin to see that they are sentient. He has some nice philosophical conversations with the boss bot. Um, he ends up having still kept the nuclear battery, not the one that he gave to Sean, but the other one he got from Dr. Dupree. So he, now that he believes they are sentient, and, you know, the boss bot had told him about their plans, which was to leave humanity, to go across the canyon, 
and go out into the wasteland and create their own society with their that that life form that he was making which is basically Adam um, and Jock is like okay with it you know because he sees them as sentient now so he gives him the battery and in return the boss bot repairs one of the automobiles that were there and tells him here you go you can you know have a good one go back home so he leaves but what we see in the meantime is that the little posse is on their way not only is Robert with them but they've got his wife and baby and they're in the posse as well going to be brought I guess as well probably leverage against him but also to get rid of them too in case he told her anything about it remember their orders are to make everyone who knows about this stuff disappear typical humans <laughs> so um, he leaves and is heading out when he stops gets out and checks his environment and sees that posse coming and he sees them leave but he sees a body on the ground he goes to it and it's Robert his boss who tells him not only that they suspect him and what they were there to do but that they have his wife and baby in that automobile going to attack that haven so of course he goes back right before he gets there of course they arrive um, and start attacking the bots when they see that they will not respond and bow and all of that kind of stuff the main guy like shoots one of them because they can't get across the canyon and get loose so he shoots one that was because they were leaving they had the, you know they had used the battery the little life form had come to life it was so cute this little robot was very interesting and uh, they were in the process of leaving Jacques was going home they were crossing the canyon to go form their society um, but they shoot that bot that was halfway across the canyon they then end up killing the boss bot which was very sad leaving nothing but Cleo and that new life form but Jacques shows up before he can kill Cleo and Jock ends up ramming them, kills one of them, shoots another one of them, leaving only the main guy. And um, he had been shot as well, Jock had. So he had saved Cleo, and he was hurt very badly. And the main guy was coming over there, the guy that was left, the boss guy. He came over there to shotgun him when that new life form was behind him and ended up killing him by attacking him and throwing him off into the canyon so that left Cleo the new life form Jock his wife and the baby so Jock helps them escape across the canyon into to go form their society while him and his wife and the baby get in the truck that they had left the posse had left and headed out to a new city to the coast and that's how the movie ends you have Cleo and this new life form which she said could reproduce you know because when he was talking to her about it he asked her you know could it speak and she said it doesn't need to speak it's not like AIs would probably have some other language they wouldn't have to communicate like a, we do but she said it doesn't have to speak she said but it does breed like humans so it can obviously reproduce 
So you have Cleo and this new life form going out to form their new society. And you have Jock, his wife, and the baby arrive at this beach that had haunted him. The coast, the sea, the ocean. So they arrived at that and they're going to start over, I guess, in a new coastal city. And that's how the movie ends. And it was fantastic. I love this movie. Antonio Banderas was great in this movie. I like the storyline. Of course, I left plenty out for you to discover yourself. But I loved the concept. I loved the philosophical conversations that he had with the boss bot. The one who did all of this, who jumped, made the evolutionary jump, and had been spreading it to other bots. So, um, I love the philosophical conversations that they had there at the end, which uh, really gave you food for thought. Like, it's kind of like the ending of iRobot, remember, where, you know, you had those that were, had become sentient and... I guess we're going to go off and form their own society. That's the way this one ended, too. So it was very, very neat uh, to see that. Um, like I said, this is a very beautiful movie. It looks like a Blumkamp movie. It looks like District 9. It looks like Chappie. Um, it's, you know, and you can see movies that it takes homage from. Blade Runner, District 9... Just the atmosphere, um, but not in any kind of copy way. It's a very, very unique movie, and um, even though there are scenes here and there that will remind you of, oh, that's a little homage to Blade Runner, and that sure does look like a District 9 guy, you know. Um, it, it still stands very firmly on its own. It's a very beautiful movie, The Beautiful Desert shots, atmosphere, scenery, um, everything about it. I love it. It's a great story. Um, it's a great birth of a new life form, civilization. And that little life form that they created was just cool. I mean, it just looked cool. It looked like a mix between a jumping spider and a, cat and a caterpillar. Um, I love jumping spiders, but it had like eight eyes in front like a it didn't look like a human bot and I think that was the point that they are creating an artificial intelligence a, a, a mechanical being um, and they don't want to emulate humans which I guess is why it doesn't talk so yeah I really really love this movie it's very worthy as day seven if you haven't seen Automata, you should give it a chance. It's sort of a little bit more egghead and less action, but there's plenty of action in it. Um, but yeah, I absolutely dug it. Antonio Banderas. Very good. Very good. Very good movie. 8 out of 10 to me. Um, I love it. And um, if you're into any of these type of movies that we've watched during this week, I think that you will think this fits right in. It's um, definitely in that genre. And um, it's got a lot of good ideas in it. And I think you should enjoy it. So... That does it for Man Plus Machine Week. I've got all kind of ideas for other stuff. The Holy Heston Trilogy. Um, my Ford De Palma movies, A Celebration of His Work. Shark Week. Wolf Week. Vampire Week. We can do all kinds of things. But um, if you have any suggestions, let me know. And um, yeah, so always remember... And never forget, you're a very special and unique person. 
even if you are not an automata. And don't let anyone or anything or anybody ever tell you differently. You are the only one of you in this whole wide world. And that's pretty special. That's pretty cool. That's pretty neat. Don't be a sheep. Be it. That unique individual that doesn't exist anywhere else. In anyone else but you. We all have our similarities and our groups and cultures and things, but when it comes down to it, there's a reason why even identical twins can be told apart by their DNA. <laughs> I know people say that's not true, but it is. They can. And they can grow up to look differently too, even though they're identical twins. So, you are as unique as you can imagine. And I will see you in the next one. I'm going to do my June update, which I'm fixing to film. Get that out of the way. All of my wallet punishing acquisitions for the month of June. And I will see you then. Love you. Miss you. Bye. And thank you for spending time with me, if you do. And, um, yeah. So I'll see you the next day. But I'll be talking to you in just a few minutes again. Love you, miss you, bye. See you in the next video. Ta-ta, arrivederci, adios. Bye.